today on how to evaluate product features. Um, I believe this might be part of a series of um, product uh, management uh, presentations. And uh, I hope to bring uh, to life this intercom manual on product uh, sure. management. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dylan. Thanks very much for this. this is, we're very excited. This is your first live, uh, so it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be nice to see you um, on our Twitter channel, Twitch channel. Twitch. And thank you, Michelle, for attending. I know you're not feeling great today, but uh, you made it, so well done. <laughs> now, uh, for the ones that are uh, tuning in uh, for the first time, the way we um, the way we do um, these kind of uh, episodes is actually. Uh, very simple. We are creating now a series of episodes actually around this uh, uh, very interesting uh, topic, which is product management, and uh, we're getting inspired by the best, as usual. And um, uh, let's uh, be more specific. Uh, actually, Dylan has been uh, uh, reading a lot of uh, papers and white papers from uh, Intercom, which is a great company, um, born in Dublin, and then, uh, grew, you know, this company grew exponentially very fast and now i think they're based in uh, san francisco and uh, they have an excellent um, an excellent white paper on product management so everything that dylan will tell you guys is gonna be uh, centered around this um, uh, this seminal white paper is that correct dylan yes it is yeah excellent so without further ado i will uh, i would like uh, to uh, put up your slides and ask you to yeah guide us through this uh, uh, very interesting journey, uh, which is um, yeah gonna um, which is gonna bring us closer to product management and uh, more importantly on um, features, right? So we're, you're gonna share with us tips and tricks on how to evaluate uh, features of existing products. Make sense? Yeah, is that correct. Exactly. I think we'll start by evaluating a current product, a product that maybe someone's already developed and is currently um, shipping. Uh, we're going to be looking at what parts of it are being used, what parts are ripe for improvement, and um, uh, just a bit of auditing. And it's a great way to start off. Excellent. So, so would I would I be uh, right saying that this is um, you know relevant for everybody who already has a product that is that has been uh, tested with clients or maybe even at a POC level, so at a very early stage? What do you think? Um, I think this talk is primarily for people who have a product and who have a user base and are able to uh, interact with the user base because the, the clients are a great source of information when trying to figure out how to get your product market fit. And uh, a lot of the techniques we'll be going through in this, uh, in this presentation will rely on uh, client feedback. Uh, however, okay. if you do not have clients, then uh, it's still important to know about these uh, techniques so that once you do from the get-go, you are monitoring these metrics, monitoring the feedback so that you can make these types of decisions Excellent. down the line. Excellent. So it's better to prepare, um, prepare now, even if you haven't shipped, it's better to listen carefully so that uh, you can be ready once uh, once your clients are starting hitting those uh, sign up button yeah exactly um okay so will we begin with the first slide unless um michelle do you yeah. have any questions um no so far it's very clear okay great um okay well uh chances are that not all of your users are using all of the features on your product uh, it is very important in product management to not just understand your product, but also how your product is being used. So how is the client using it? When, why, and what parts? Uh, just to clarify when I'm talking about a feature, we're not talking about um, account creation or a, a password reset. Um, we'd be more focusing on actual features that you would like the customers to use and why they would use your product over any others. Uh, so one of the best things to do when thinking about uh, these kinds of questions is to visualize your feature usage. So essentially, we want to know what percent of your customers have adopted each feature. So on the right here, you see a graph um, with um, a mock uh, product. I think it's a social uh, network app. And with each of the 
um, features, we have a percent of the user base which is actively using it. Yeah. So this graph does not show the most ideal scenario. Uh, in a perfect world, maybe all of your features would be loved and used all the time by all of your clients. Um, however, it is more realistic. Um, you uh, Here, maybe we have our core features, and these are the features that maybe we started off with. Maybe they were heavily um, they're your competitive advantage. They could be the ones that you market more. And um, essentially, there's a lot of reasons why some uh, features are more heavily influenced than others. Um, so if you want to go into the next slide. Yeah, just one, one uh, clarification. Um, so what you're saying here is that basically we have to measure uh, the usage of uh, features, right? And I imagine that there are multiple tools to do that. Like, for instance, I know Mixpanel, but that's uh, just one of them. Um, and once uh, we measure the, um, you know, the, the, how popular or how used a, a feature is, then we're able to, you know, reason about what else to deploy, what to kill, what to what to invest uh, in more, and so on. Does it make sense? Yeah, it harks back to what we were talking about earlier. So important to make sure that you have a plan for tracking your customer feedback and your customer mm -hmm. data. Um, cause these things can make huge, um, inroads in your decisions later on about how this product develops. And another follow-up question, uh, Dylan, if that's okay. Um, what do you think we should track? I mean, shall we track, uh, the amount of times that a feature is used? Uh, shall we measure it with, um, you know, number of clicks? Uh, so any, any ideas on, on, or any, um, insights on how to do this properly in, uh, the, um, intercom uh, uh, guide. Um, the intercom guide doesn't go too heavily on this. However, it is very product specific. So for example, if we have a product and each feature we want to be maximizing its use of, and we also have one uh, target audience and one group of users, then it's simply just looking at the clicks. It's looking about time being used. Um, for example, in this example, the product of a social network, we, we don't just want to look at pro like if a time clicked on the newsfeed, we want to know how long they're spending on the newsfeed. So it, it, it takes a bit of time to really detail these things and to come up with a strategy to, as you say, uh, know what to track and when. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but for me, it, it seems very a very um, fluid process. Absolutely. I think it depends on the feature, right? Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, if a feature is I don't know a button like for instance you know you know what our what our product is right uh, we have a, a video analysis tool and uh, we are showing videos um, a li little bit on YouTube with advanced uh, features like uh, multi speed uh, object recognition etc so multi speed is obviously a feature that can be um, can be used or cannot be used doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, count the number of minutes that this feature is used. It's more about, you know, designing that KPI in the correct way. In that case, would be given a video or given a viewing session, how many times that, uh, you know, multi-speed option is used. So it would be a percentage, right? Um, I think the challenge then is to normalize everything, um, you know, all these different features, all these dif different usage measures, um, in the same uh, framework so that you can compare apples with apples, pair with pairs, and not mix up things. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, some, some features are whole new add-ons to your product, and some are just enhancing the experience of an already used feature. So it's very, yeah, very true. Okay. And so this slide is showing um, another scenario where we see there's just one feature that the majority of our clients are using. And mm -hmm. so here, so maybe you could think of this as um, something like maybe Google Hangouts in uh -huh. Google Plus. It's a feature mm -hmm. that Google has, but maybe not many people are using. When you look yeah. at a chart like this, you have to be aware that this company may be vulnerable to disruption. So uh -huh. someone can maybe just build a simple product focusing on the key feature that your users actually like, make it faster and cheaper because you don't have all this junk that you're carrying around with you. This is why it's yep. important to make sure you're evaluating these metrics because if you're spending lots of time 
on features that are not being used while your key feature is being capitalized on by another company can be very detrimental to your market. This is actually interesting, Michelle, isn't it? Because from uh, uh, from um, a, yeah, signals of your product, you can uh, really derive insights on uh, your longer term strategy and your vulnerability to competition. So this is uh, this this yeah, is definitely. very valuable, right? Yeah, it allows you to track as well your competition. If it is the case that you have a product that does like five different things and you want to be a pioneer in these five different things, but you're looking at your competition and you're seeing that some of them are improving on this one key feature that you're trying to retain, then mm -hmm. at least for that quarter, for the next couple of quarters, you know that you should really be putting your investment into improving this one feature to make sure that you stay ahead of the game. So yeah, from a business perspective, it's very powerful. Yeah. I would, I would agree. Um, so the next slide here is really the next step here. So once we've done this audit, once we understand how our clients are using the product, in what way, in what proportions, then we have to start making decisions on how do we deal with these products or features that are getting limited adoption. And I've listed here four options. So mm -hmm. of course, there's the obvious kill it, uh, remove mm -hmm. it. Um, the second one is to increase the adoption rate. So this is just essentially getting more people, more percentage of the user base to use this product. Mm -hmm. And the other ones increase the frequency. So maybe you do have a, a significant minority of people using it and you can get them to use it more, make it more worthwhile for you and your business. And finally is to actually improve it. So making a qualitative and quantifiably measurable change in what you are doing with this feature. How does it work? Maybe it's not doing enough for to justify the adoption rate of other uh, client bases. So the, let me let me ask you another question. Um, let's say for argument's sake that we go for four, okay, uh, which means that we are in trying to improve it. Um, does this mean that we would have to then run uh, clients or user interviews, like qualitative analysis of uh, in order feedback in order to you know, find the, the way to improve that feature that is underused? Or is there any suggestion that comes from uh, uh, Intercom regarding this uh, specific uh, option? Uh, yeah, so changing, I will address it more later on, but essentially when you are pretty much redesigning your feature, so you've already shipped this feature, you thought that this is what your client base wanted, you thought that this would work, now it, you're getting data, you have to make an informed decision that you may be wrong. You need to reevaluate why you thought it was going to be like this, why you think it was mm -hmm. going to be valuable. So now we have to think how, yeah, you're right. So we need to ask the clients why, so we can bring our hypothesis to them, but we need to understand why they're not using it. It could be simple reasons as if it's not explained right, or um, the there's a bug that we don't know about, but it, it really does change from time to time. But I think uh, large scale redesigns are a very, it's a bit of a sledgehammer. And of mm. course, it's not the first option any product manager would like to implement, especially after launching a, a feature, but it mm -hmm. is definitely something to consider if it is a drastic uh, decision to be made. Interesting. Michelle, any, far, uh, any other questions, any other comments regarding this? Because you know, there's a lot to explore actually here, right? Yeah, um, just what Dylan was saying there, that if it is the case that you need to bring in like a sledgehammer, um, is that, uh, well, from where I'm standing, it feels like that's definitely one approach. And the other approach is to keep tweaking it a little bit until it improves. Um, from your perspective, or at least from what you've learned from Intercom, which is more utilized and for what reason? Um, I think, I think increasing the adoption, I think we have to assume that the methods inside your business, um, were correct in when you were uh, developing this feature, which be a talk later mm -hmm. on. Um, so you went through the right roadmap, you know, why you made this feature, how you made it. So it could just be a problem of, um, letting people know more about it. Um, so yeah, these, these. Number two and three, increasing the frequency and adoption, it is um, a more gentle touch. And I would probably prefer that over making dramatic decisions. 
Um, I'm sure it's pretty common sense just to make sure, but also talking to your clients as well. So you can very easily, you can find out if people like the feature or not, but mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes harder to understand why they're not using it. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's a, psychologically, it's a very, it's a bit of a problem when you're always relying on like the feedback of like the people or the clients. Because sometimes they don't really know what they want, as opposed to like what they actually need. And sometimes you produce what they want, but then it turns out that it's not actually what they need, and then you have to like revert back. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, we had a meeting today, Dylan. Do you remember? I mean, uh, the customer knew exactly what it, they wanted, but mm -hmm. um, they didn't know, you know, how to, you know, implement it in a very simple and a very streamlined way. Um, and this is uh, this is a big challenge because. You know, if you follow what your customers say, um, mm. uh, essentially you go and you essentially address their pain, but at the same time, you could be uh, embarking yourself in a very painful journey, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Anything else around here? Or shall we uh, no, I think we next? can move on. It kind of leads into the next slide where we're talking about how to improve uh, these features. So shipping code or in a software product doesn't necessarily mean you're improving anything. So similarly, you can make undeniable, undeniable improvements to parts of your product and get no response or appreciation for it. Uh, it all comes down to the type of improvements you're making. The two most popular ways of improving your product is to add new features that people would like and hence increase product usage or to improve existing ones. So in this talk, we're going to focus on improving existing features mm -hmm. uh, before moving on to new features in another talk. Excellent. And I like it because, you know, with, with the first approach, the Occam Razor approach, which is, you know, sorry, with the, the second approach, instead of adding, we keep or maybe we remove stuff, uh, which is also easier and more economic, um, you know, it's it's easier, it's easier to deal with what you have. Um, so, and, uh, you know, as opposed to add new stuff that brings a lot of known unknown and unknown unknown. So I really like, I really like number two. Okay, great. Okay, so I've listed three um, steps here we can do. So it's, you can make it better, we can change it, make it more accessible. So I'm just gonna go through each of them pretty briefly. Um, so making it better. So this is when you know why a customer uses a, a current f feature and what they appreciate about it. A deliberate improvement seeks only to make it better in ways in which will be appreciated by the current user. Uh, for example, making it faster, easier to use or improving the design. Um, so imagine for YouTube, maybe just if the user interface of the when you're watching the video isn't great, you can make that better. That's the one feature people are using, they love it, make it better, people will use it more. Um, use deliberate improvements when A, there is a feature that all your customers use and like, or you see an opportunity to add significant value to it. Um, it's worth maybe noting that this is quite a high risk, high reward strategy. Surprisingly, it's um, you when you have a feature that a lot of your customers use and like, when you're changing it, you need to be very careful that you don't damage the underlying uh, desirability of that feature. A lot of there's too many horror stories of the past of products where the product team thought they were going to make something that people loved, and then people are like, "No, put it back." So it is very, very tread lightly when you're talking when you're touching people things that people love. Um, so the second one there is. So we just change it. So these are improvements that hopefully get to um, get the customer to use the feature a bit more. So adding more items into an activity feed, for example, or options on a search tool. Uh, it could mean that they might start using the, the feature maybe daily instead of weekly. Um, this kind of improvement is worth considering since it could have very important implications for your business. So say uh, your business relies on new videos being uploaded to your platform. 
if you have a feature that allows you to upload videos and you improve that to make it easier and faster, then you get more videos, and that's very important for your business. All right, uh, and we can we can hear a lot of uh, happy <laughs> kids uh, celebrating uh, Halloween, I guess. So yeah. that's great. It's a great new feature. Uh, okay, Gilad is trying to yeah he's trying to mitigate uh, the enthusiasm. <laughs> Uh, Michelle, any any comments on this? Any observations? I think uh, you know it, it, you know makes a lot of sense uh, uh, to address all the three options because um, the, the reality is that we don't know we don't know what mm -hmm. is going to make the biggest impact on um, you know the value for the client. Any ideas? Any you know any um, prioritization here that you can think of? Um... Not for that, but I do have a slight kind of comment. It's that at first glance, right, um, how to improve your features seems like the easier route. But as Dylan was saying there about um, when you're making it better and where you have to be careful that you don't damage anything that your clients already like, it does feel like it's a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of really, really good assessments, like every minute detail. It feels like it's a lot of work even just like to improve the satisfaction just by a little bit. But yeah, it's... Exactly, exactly. Dylan, you're muted, so unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, no yeah, that's very important. So similarly for the last one, where you talk about the adoption improvement, um, mm -hmm. you want to get more people to use it that may be using a feature that aren't even using it at all. Um, so this is generally uh, what you're saying there is using a feature or a technique called the why or so what. So mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself or ask your clients, why are you not using this feature? And it's not a base level question. It can go very deep. So mm -hmm. why do they don't see the value? Why maybe they can't show it to their boss? Why? Because it's not in a suitable format. Um, why? Because our tools aren't good enough. Why? Because the API isn't getting enough data or isn't getting the, the right quality data. So if you ask this time, it's, this may get lead you to one uh, angle, but you have to be careful because it could, if you ask that to a different person, you could get a different yeah. root uh, cause. So this is where data and consumer feedback is very important. Um, so and aggregating this so you really understand the true cause of why these things are happening and this is you know this is also uh, highlighting the need uh, for advanced tools like for instance intercom because you know let's be honest i mean uh, intercom is a great a great way to connect and uh, uh, collect customer feedback right so in a sense uh, what we are saying here is uh, uh, you need to design from the beginning and your product in such a way that um, you know collecting data, collecting uh, uh, signals from your customers is uh, really one click away. Uh, your customer mm -hmm. needs to uh, be able to share whatever um, whatever feedback they have in a frictionless way, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that piece of feedback needs to be stored in your CRM for later analysis. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, shall we move forward, Dylan? Um, so that brings an end to this section of the talk. I was actually just going to mention pretty briefly on um, this notion of continuous improvement in early mm -hmm. stage startups. So we talked earlier about how there's some companies that maybe don't have um, a huge client base. And that's sometimes to their advantage because early startups have the um, have some advantages over incumbents that they are able to move quickly and adapt fast mm -hmm. without much te technical debt or legacy features or um, mm -hmm. red tape. So high value customers um, may be more likely to move to a startup because we're able to identify maybe where the incumbent. So um, you can use these tools is what I'm saying. Uh, as a startup to looking at another company. So looking at what products or features they use that maybe are kind of a bit redundant and what are really important, mm -hmm. but maybe they're not focusing on enough. And this can really be beneficial to early stage startups. Yeah. 
Interesting. Uh, can you delve a little bit more into this concept of continuous improvement so that you know our audience uh, uh, really um, get into the nuances of 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 of, um, of this? Can you give us the intuition behind this continuous improvement uh, methodology? Um, yeah. So, well, the product manager's challenge is really twofold. Firstly, you're trying to find improvements that will benefit the business and its customers. And secondly, you're ensuring that these, these improvements don't get lost on a whiteboard somewhere and maybe just become, maybe they aren't necessary for the moment because mm -hmm. of, um, there's one, there's one uh, famous idiom about uh, shipping on web products is that if you're not shipping, you're dead. You really need to be fully aware of what's going on all the time in real time, making okay. sure that when you have a, a feature, you have to be completely, um, you have to be completely um, aware that you don't know everything. You can't mm -hmm. assume that you understand what your clients think. Like the client psychology is very, very well studied, but very, very well like misunderstood very well. Um, sometimes as Michelle was saying, it doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's really, that's that tense. It's really important to make sure you're constantly evaluating your features, constantly monitoring these um, metrics, and also thinking of new and innovative ways to improve. So, is it fair to say that you know after you're shipping, you're evaluating, um, and then you are, uh, yeah, redesign or tweak, and then you ship and you're evaluating, and this is a virtual cycle in the sense that by going through iterations uh, you are able to converge to a steady state where um, feature adoption increases customer satisfaction increases and uh, yeah you have delivered more value over a course of very short iterations and in a very short uh, period of time right yeah, exactly. It's, you're pretty much imagine yourself as your own competition. You always want to be looking at yourself and thinking, where, mm -hmm. why isn't this optimum? Where is the extra value that's not being added? And that way, you can maybe uh, stop those pesky startups from stealing, from capitalizing <laughs> on your <laughs> uh, non-continuous improving features. Yeah, but cool. as a pesky startup, this is to your advantage, really. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, as you were saying, yeah, uh, startups have a more of a, um, they're much more flexible and they change very quickly. The teams are smaller and if the investment is there, if they get the data back and they're assessing the data correctly, they're able to change much faster to the incumbents because they're not, if they change one feature, they're not changing an entire ecosystem where it doesn't branch out that easily as opposed to if you're one of like the bigger companies and you have all of these like clientele and they're from different sectors, they have like different favorites or like different preferences for the features. If you change one thing, it could easily cascade down without proper like research. But yeah, so <laughs> startups, and, you know, the good, listen up. The good, the good news is that the they, they customer needs are so varied and um, mm -hmm. um, there are so many of them that, you know, it's 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 really hard to imagine that one product will uh, will fit all those needs. Uh, which is good news because yeah. there is room for a lot of different, uh, a lot of different mm -hmm. products. Let's think. Let's think, for instance, about pro about um, yeah, project management. Okay, project management is one of the hardest. Uh, you know, if you think about it, project management is is really hard. Okay, really hard. And every project manager uh, has its own preference. Uh, has to deal with different types of projects. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to imagine a situation where within the market of product management tools, uh, there is one tool that fulfills all those needs, right? And uh, um, if you know, if you, you know, dig into those customer needs and you segment properly your customer base, then you're going to be able to fulfill those needs and you're going to be able to sell your software more easily. Um, this is the first observation. The second observation from my perspective, as a user, um, I see that there are features that are more easily um, reproducible or you know mm. more easily um, yeah. re-implemented than others. Obviously, the ones that are 
uh, that require uh, intellectual property, that require expertise. I mean, at Spark, you know, we do AI and machine learning, so it's not exactly, you know, the easiest uh, thing to uh, reproduce and copy. Uh, but there are other products that are more vulnerable to competition and more vulnerable mm -hmm. to this kind of copy paste. Uh, think about, for instance, uh, Snapchat and uh, what happened to them after Instagram, um, you know, mm. uh, got inspired by features <laughs> and stories, right? So they started to, they stopped growing, um, um, you know, at, at the previous rate. And, mm. uh, you know, their the growth uh, trend, uh, you know, was really impacted by, 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 by this move from Instagram. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, is, uh, it, it is very hard uh, to spot what are the best features um, and, and because the best features are the one that essentially your customers want, but probably the best features are at the intersection of uh, two different uh, groups. Group one is uh, obviously value for your client, but group two is also uh, reproducibility, or in other mm. words, you know, um, the ability of other companies to take that features and bring it um, into their product. Does it make sense, Dylan, what I'm saying? No, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I agree, yeah. It is, yeah, it's, it's uh, of course, when, it, when you're talking about anything in product or um, the business sphere, it's, it's, it's never easily um, distilled into a model that's easy to understand or to manipulate. There's so many different factors to think about. And that's why it's such an interesting thing to sort of look into. I know I found it so interesting just reading this uh, white paper. It's um, it's a real multidisciplinary field that you really need to be on your toes to stay on top of. Absolutely, excellent. I think, uh, I feel like we're getting to the uh, natural end of this conversation. So um, what I would like to do now is to remind to our audience that uh, next week we're going to be live again on uh, this uh, um, on this uh, series with a, a second episode more focused on what, Dylan? Can you remind us? Uh, next week, I believe, we'll be discussing um, when to say no to new features. So mm -hmm. that'll be an interesting topic. So Good. Love to Stay tuned like to figure out more. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, this is a, this is a good uh, way to uh, start our weekend and uh, thank our audience for watching the live. Uh, as usual, all the material, the slides will be linked in the description below. So uh, thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Michelle. And I'll see you next week, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>